Joining us once again today, folks, on the 11th of June, 2021, is USA Eagles head coach Gary Gold. And I just want to get on and talk for a few minutes about selections for the uh, the summer test series. Now, you're going to the UK on the 4th of July. Ironically, you'll be playing England at Twickenham. Uh, that's kind of the mecca of rugby there. And then uh, just six days after that, you'll be in Dublin at Aviva Stadium playing the Irish Rugby Football Union. So, Gary... Um, these two test matches coming up, you have uh, I've seen you at several venues. Uh, I was out there. We've run into each other a couple of times as you were looking at Major League Rugby players to make these selections. And there's a few things we'll probably talk about here. You might want to talk about is how Major League Rugby, the existence of it, has given us some advantages here as far as um, players would experience and also a chance that players have had. Uh, Gary's trying to get a better position there for the light. There it is. Much better. <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. Uh, <laughs> pay no attention to those boxes on top of the shelf. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but uh, there are some advantages. The fact that we have professional rugby now here in the states, you got players playing week in and week out with each other or against each other. So, Gary, uh, you, you were traveling around, and uh, Major League Rugby has been a big focus for the selection. Has it been helpful to uh, to have Major League Rugby to come up with an Eagle squad? Oh, there's no question of a doubt. Um, you know, any any competition that our players can play in is going to be hugely valuable. Um, you know, when I first started with the Eagles. You know, off the back of, you know, in our first tour, the guys, the guys were being selected after having not played rugby for nearly six months. So, you know, the fact that they're now able to uh, be able to get into camp and play is a, is a massive thing for us, you know. Being in a competitive environment day in and day out um, has made a huge difference. Um, a daily training environment, um, the coaching's really improved as well over the years as well. So, that makes a huge difference. And, you know, just for our guys to get to understand and be a part of a professional environment has made a huge difference. Um, that, that from their benefit point of view, which is the most important thing, and then from our benefit, you know, obviously the, the, the um, importance of being able to monitor and track the players, um, stay in touch with the clubs, find out how they're doing, uh, get to understand uh, what they're doing during the course of the week, you know, in terms of their running or the rugby element of, of things. And um, and then we track it every single week from a game performance point of view. So we've got a much better handle. We can make, we can make much better decisions um, on, on the selections. And, and it's, it's not so much of a, of a situation where you, where you're guessing anymore in, in terms of how I think it probably was largely through no fault of anybody's in the old days, um, and just hoping that you're getting guys who are a fit enough and be good enough to play international rugby. So, I mean, it's been a huge benefit. Um, it's going to be very interesting for me to see how how we do go against these these two two nations. You know, um, obviously everybody's been hit really hit hard by COVID at the moment, and um, England and Ireland are you know are two countries who've actually been able to play quite a lot of rugby. So. Um, for us not having played for two years, it's, it's going to be incredibly difficult, but they're going to be two very, very tough test matches, but that's what we wanted. Well, in fact, that's a good point that you make there, Gary. The last time the Eagles were on the pitch was in Osaka against Tonga, if I'm not mistaken, in 2019, yes? That's right, yeah. Uh, so that's quite a challenge. Now, let me ask this question with Major League Rugby season in full swing. And of course, you've been you've been looking for talent out there walking around. We've got um, the season still in progress right now. Have you already gotten players or will they be released to you at a certain point? Yeah, you know, it doesn't look like you have the benefit of several weeks of a, a training camp to get guys ready. No, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, it's not the s s situation. Uh, you know, we've announced the squad now, and, and unfortunately, we we're going to have to wait for the weekend's games of that weekend, the twenty fourth, twenty fifth, twenty sixth weekend, to be completed before the guys are able to fly out. So, again, not an ideal situation that you know a handful of our guys, particularly the guys playing on the west coast on Sunday, are only really going to get into London on on. Uh, on, on a Tuesday before a weekend's test match, which is, is far from far from ideal, but it is what it is. You know, I'd rather do that than be able to play, you know. So uh, it's it's a difficult situation at the moment that we're going through uh, for various different reasons. But, um, yeah, that's just another one of the challenges that we've got. But we're not able to get together. Uh, we haven't been able to get together either. Um, but what we have done is, you know, we've got, we've got issues like this, Chris, we've got Zoom and, you know, we can communicate to the players and we can stay in touch and, and, uh, hopefully, hopefully share as much information as possible. And luckily the good news is that the guys are actually getting to play rugby. 
Well, and I'd say the other thing too is it's while you have, uh, I see that your pared down squad, your travel squad for, for the UK and Ireland is 30. It was announced. Uh, I see that you've got at least nine uncapped players on there, but you still have a lot of players. You got the granddaddy long legs there, Cam Dolan with 51 test matches under his belt and a number of players in the 20 test match bracket. So surprisingly, I didn't realize that Hunkel Chemisleis has got 21 test under his belt already. Uh, that's uh, he's been at this for five years. It seems like he just came on a scene yesterday. But what I'm getting at is you've, you've got some experience there. It's not like it's all debutantes. Uh, so do you feel comfortable with the mix of veterans and the level of experience in international test and, and then having some uncapped guys? Yeah, I mean, that was that was the whole, if I can call it the science behind the selection. I mean, there was a lot of thinking behind the selection, many, many hours of of uh, of, of a thought process. Um, we, we, we wanted to use the opportunity to reward players who had played well in the MLR, reward players who had played well, but particularly in the MLR. Um, but we wanted to do that in conjunction with not necessarily giving up all of our experience. So the spine of our team will still be really experienced. You know, we, we, we've got experienced uh, hookers, uh, you know, experienced second rowers, a handful of experienced back rowers. Um, AJ obviously uh, in the mix as well, um, and then you know the likes of Mikey Tears and Will Hooley's uh, in the in the, in the outside backs with Marcel, you know does give us that level of experience with with also the exuberance of youth and and the exciting the the exciting prospects of some of the younger players that have that are are doing really well in the MLR at the moment who we, who we're looking to give a chance to so it it was it was the idea I mean again. Uh, these test matches are obviously very, very important, but we really now having to use these test matches as, as a preparation period for for our Rugby World Cup qualifiers later in the year in September and October. So, you know, we'll get to see a whole lot of players. We'll continue to get to see quite a lot more of, of the MLR before the end of the, the regular season, which is another six weeks left. And, you know, then it's down to the real business side of things, which is which is playing Canada in September. Well, that's what I was about to get at is that uh, we're only two years away from 2023 because of all this, this nonsense we've had to deal with around the globe the past 18 months. So it's not that far. We're already in the window for 2023. And so you're really, this is a proving ground. And I was going to get to that. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you probably have different markers of success and maybe you may not want to say them, but I would, I mean, from a, from a, an Eagles fans perspective, I would say the fact that we field a team is a victory in itself. I mean, it's been a challenging time. Number two, the fact that you're able to get talent that's played against each other and gotten a lot of uh, time in this year just before you go to do the test. That's one. And then the fact that you're able to schedule test matches against the likes of the Tier 1 nations of England and Ireland. There was rumor that the uh, Eagles might get to play against the Springboks this summer, but that doesn't seem to have come to fruition. They went with Georgia uh, for two test series, and then the British and Irish Lions to empty stadiums, mind you. But uh, that's coming up. But um, so this is, uh, I, I think that uh, probably from a fan's perspective, uh, we should be uh, understanding realize that this is kind of a proving ground for the Eagles to get ready for what really matters, and that's qualifying for the World Cup. Did, did I get that right? Or was that, would, would that be your sentiment? Yeah, I think that's pretty spot on. I think that's fair to say. Um, I mean, in terms of expectations, obviously within the camp, we set ourselves extraordinarily high expectations. I mean, obviously we're going to go to, to the UK with you know, the best expectations, but we realize how tough it's going to be, you know, not only playing away from home, not only because of the travel, not only we, we, we hugely affected um, one or two players that we wanted to select into the squad can't come because of one or two various COVID situations. You know, um, uh, COVID won't even allow it. In fact, the game against the Springboks was supposed to have gone ahead. Um, and the only reason the games didn't go ahead with the Springboks is because it was also in the schedule for us to play England and we can't play South Africa and get into England in time because of COVID. So that's the, actually the only reason why they, they went with Georgia. Otherwise, you know, we were scheduled to play South Africa in those two tests. Um, but, you know, that's just the time that we're in at the moment now. And, you know, they challenges and they speed bumps in the road and, and we accept them and we move on. But I think you've summed it up really, really well. I mean, we, we, we're going to use these two weeks as valuably as we possibly can, as you say, to, to, um, first and foremost, hopefully put up a really, really credible performance against England and Ireland. And then secondly, because, you know, it's, it's going to be invaluable time for us to be able to spend together before we come together for, for what's really going to be an important test series against Canada. 
Well, can you just imagine? I'm sure that uh, you were probably pretty excited about it. Uh, I, I imagine fans all these years, uh, many of us complained about the fact that it's difficult to get matches against tier one nations. And then we potentially, if it were not for COVID, would have had the Springboks, England and Ireland all in one test season. That would have been unbelievable. It's still pretty unbelievable to get England and Ireland one test season. But man, it would have been something else. We could also got the Springboks in there. So maybe we'll, we'll get that test scheduled in the future if we get past this nonsense. Well, that's, that's right, you know, Chris. I mean, that, that's so true what you say there, you know. A handful of years ago, all of us were moaning and groaning. We can't get, you know, tier one opposition and, you know, nobody wants to play us. And, you know, now we've got a, a number of those opportunities. And, and in fact, to be honest with you, there might even be a few more during the course of this year. You know, there still might be some more, you know, uh, really good fixtures lined up for the, for, for the rest of this year. So, I mean, it's exciting times at the moment. And I think we must embrace it and we must be positive about it. And, uh, yeah, there's, 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 as I said earlier, you know, there are loads of challenges that we've got, but lots of other people have got challenges as well. You know, it's just a privilege to be back and playing and, you know, wear, wearing the, the USA jersey again and, and being able to get onto the park. And uh, look, I, I, I have absolutely no doubt that this group of 30 guys are, are going to give their all for, for 80 minutes of rugby. And um, yeah, funnier things have happened. Eh? Funnier things have happened. Well, I think uh, I'd have to say, Gary, that uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm preaching the converted. You're the head coach. You know the plan. But I think for, for Eagles fans, uh, the, the priority here really is, is, to, is to knock Canada back. Sorry. Sorry, Canada. But we've, we've got to get that number one selection. We've got to get that selection so that spend the next two years uh, getting more experience for players and, and bringing young guys along so that we actually can win maybe a couple of games in 2023 in France. That would be pretty amazing. Tough pull for us in 2023. But nonetheless, there is a chance the Eagles could, could, could impress some folks there if if we get into that first qualifier yeah exactly um you know let's just take it one step at a time and as you quite rightly say um you know after the summer our next big challenge is canada in a home and away fixture and um just a huge amount of respect for our rivals you know i think um you know the the, the fact that they're together largely as a group in the mlr is going to have made a huge difference for them um, again, don't underestimate how difficult it's been for the Arrows in this MLR competition. Mm. These poor guys haven't actually been home for months and months, all living out of suitcases because of the, the pandemic and just to play rugby. And so I think you people would be making a very grave error if they if they write off that Canadian team. If, if anything, I think they're going to be stronger because of it. So, um, yeah, I've, I've got a huge amount of respect for them, for their coaching staff. Um, I'm worried about the challenge that they're going to bring. And, uh, and, and that's the reason why we have to be unbelievably well prepared for, for what, you know, when we, when we play against them in, in September. Now you've made a couple additions to your coaching staff here. I noticed recently, I see that uh, you've hired uh, Rob Hoadley as an assistant coach and uh, the uh, former Eagle uh, Chris Wiles has come on as a coach assistant. Uh, is that helping you flesh out your coaching staff? And uh, you think that's going to make a difference for you? No, it's not flushing out the co coaching staff. I mean, uh, the, the other issue that we've got at the moment is, you know, a lot of those coaches are involved in the MLR and they can't get away at the moment now. Um, if you remember, originally, according to the original plan, uh, the MLR was supposed to have been over by July. Um, unfortunately, it was, it was put back because of the pandemic. And, you know, that's the only reason why there's an overlap at the moment now, you know, again, through no fault of anybody's other than the pandemic. Um, so that's, that's um, you know, put me in a position where, you know, the, the co current coaching staff or the coaches that are all working in the MLR aren't available at the moment now. Um, and so that's that's been a little bit unfortunate, but it has allowed an opportunity for a hugely experienced guy like Rob Hoadley to come on board. Um, ironically enough, I was, I was actually looking at Hodes to potentially bring him in in any case, uh, just because of experience and knowledge of the U.S., uh, players and and his massive success that he's had at San Diego and and you know just a hugely experienced coach around uh, about around and about the entire situation whether it's the college game or the club game right around the country um, so he's going to join us and and yes you know Chris is based in the UK at the moment obviously recently retired um, and Chris is going to be working with uh, you know our senior players as a, as a coach assistant as well that's right.
Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I might not have enunciated well. I, I, I said flushing out. I think you might have heard me say flushing out. I, I don't. I hope that's not what you heard. I wasn't saying flushing your coach. Because I meant uh, fl- yeah, fl- no, I'm not fl- flushing anybody no, else. <laughs> no, 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 fl- <laughs> flushing out. Now, and that's what I was getting at. Is because of, because all involved major league rugby, it's probably difficult for you to pull guys in that simply aren't available. Right. Like if you want Scott Lawrence, you can't have him. He's in rugby Atlanta. He's kind of right. busy right now. So that's where I was going. Well, thanks for that, Gary. So AJ McGinty is your captain once again. Um, he's um, he's he's. He's uh, that fly half is uh, done well with the U S he's approaching 30 caps. I think this will be his 29th cap. Uh, I imagine uh, he's looking forward to this chance to go to England. Uh, Cause of course he's played uh, over on that side of the pond. Yeah. He's been, he's been absolutely massive for us. Um, you know, we we've got one of the things that we've looked to, to, to implement and change um, because of the pandemic, but just also because of a lot of the situations is having a lot more of a player led um, environment, you know, where the players um, are are going to have a lot more say in terms of the direction that they're looking to take. And, you know, on that front, AJ has been fantastic with his group of senior players, um, you know, Bryce and Marcel and even Nate Augsburger, even though Nate's injured, I mean, Nate would have gone on tour otherwise. Nate's input's been brilliant and, and, and Bryce and Will Hooley and um, you know, Cam Dolan and Nick Savetta, and they, they've been absolutely, um, Nate Brakeley as well. They've all been brilliant in terms of having conversations with them. And, uh, and AJ has been, you know, been largely heading that up, you know, particularly around the attack and, you know, what the players are aspiring to do. And um, it's exciting times from that point of view. You know, I'm, I, I, I've got to a situation now where we're in the group and we've been together long enough that there's just a huge amount of trust you know, that I have for the players and the player group. And, um, and I'm excited to, to, to um, work alongside them in, in terms of this new way that we, you know, I'm, I'm wanting us to work, which is a hell of a lot more player led. Um, and, and, you know, with the, the senior players that we've got in the group taking the lead with that, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's exciting to see the product that we can mm-hmm. produce at the end of the day. Well, Gary, what I want to ask you, because you've just mentioned a lot of the, the old stalwarts and names we know, Marcel, you talk about Nate Brakely, you talk about Nick Savetta, Cam Dolan, names that, that Eagles fans are going to recognize, faces are going to know because they've been around there for a while and they've been contributing. But you've got some some debutantes here. You've got uh, nine uncapped players you're taking to the, the aisles. And uh, I'm looking at the list, and one that stands out to me is Luke Cardi. I, I, I don't know if people know him, but I think they want to keep an eye on him. Any players we should, um, without letting any secrets out of the, you know, the planning for the game, any of these uh, new players that uh, people may not know that we might want to keep an eye out for seeing them perform on the pitch? Well, again, I mean, if, if you know, if, if anybody's, you know, been following MLR rugby, I'm sure none of these names will be, you know, unfamiliar to anybody. Um uh, Mike Deboulis has been doing really well for Old Glory. You know, he's a multifunctional player. He's played in a couple of positions there. Ryan Reese has d- done very well for Atlanta. Um, and and as you say, you know, uh, Luke Carty has done very, very well, obviously playing behind Matt Gitter. But when he's come on, he's made, a, he's made a huge impression. I've watched a lot of his rugby. I've watched a lot of the tape that I've been able to, to get my hands on, not only from the LA games that he's come on, but a little bit of his history as well. Uh, he's got a huge rugby pedigree coming from Ireland, obviously, and um, his brother being in the Irish squad. Um, and, you know, he might wanted to make the move for that very reason, you know, to put his hand up to play for, for USA. So, I mean, I'm excited about all the all the youngsters that we've got. You know, Connor Moonahan is first draft last year um, in, 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 in the draft, which was just announced yesterday. There's going to take place again in August of this year. And, um, it's great to see that you know we are able to acknowledge a you know a guy that the, the league acknowledged by being a first draft pick. You know that you know he's he's stepped up and and he's lived up to to those expectations. And you know we excited to give him an, give him an opportunity. And and that goes for all. I think it's actually ten. I think it goes for all ten of the guys who haven't yet been capped. You know we excited to see to see them all and and see if they can step up to the plate and, and we realize it's going to be an absolutely monumental challenge for some of these guys. You know a lot of these guys have only recently just come into MLR and 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 even that level is is quite high. And Test match rugby, especially against teams who are who are both in the top five of the world rankings, will will be a significant step up. There's no question of a doubt. And it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how, how the guys go and, and how they can make the step up. 
Well, I would think that any objective observer would look at uh, at your your selections to, to make the trip, and uh, ten out of thirty that are going are uncapped players. That that clearly shows a commitment towards developing and and, and building a squad, so you can you can uh, have a good chance uh, in the games that really really matter coming down the road of the World Cup and uh, any other competitions we got going on. So that's I think it's really encouraging. Uh, are you are you um, well, I should ask this question. So to Twickenham, the first, the last thing I saw is they're limiting the audience to 10,000 spectators, even though Japan is playing uh, the British and Irish Lions, they have 16,000 at Murray Field. So, <laughs> but London's only getting 10,000. Will there be fans in the stands at Aviva Stadium? I've not found any information about whether it'll be spectators or it'll be an empty stadium. Do you know that yet? My, my understanding is that on both of those fronts, Chris, that they, they're actually reviewing the whole policy as we speak. Um, there's there's a there's there's a whole situation going on at the moment where you know England is supposed to come out of full lockdown on the on the 21st um, officially, and you know then I believe it's going to be looked at every week after that in terms of what's happening. So I've heard a number of things. I've he- I've heard it could potentially be more than 10,000 in Twickenham. I think it could be you know up to a third, which would be th- which would be nearly 30,000 spectators. Um, and at this stage, I've heard nothing in their Viva. But uh, again, you know, somebody contacted me two days ago and said from Ireland and said that they had announced that there may be spectators. So I think it's a bit of a wait and see situation. I mean, again, it's it's been a, a, this whole pandemic has been a moving target the entire time. So I mean, there's no reason it should stop being a moving target now. But you know, the more people, the more people that are being vaccinated, I'm, I'm assuming. I'm not a doctor, but I'm assuming that's a good thing, you know, and I think more people that have been vaccinated means that, you know, then, then we're on top of that. And that means more people can, can mingle in public spaces. So again, I, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but the latest I've heard is that it'll be about 30,000 in Twickenham. And, and at this stage, we're still waiting to hear what the story is in Ireland. But even even at just ten thousand, that's going to be more spectators than most of the of the guys playing for the Eagles ever experienced in their career, except for those who played overseas. So I mean that that's got to be that alone, that environment. Say it's ten or thirty thousand, has to be very good to get these guys developed. I mean that's that's I mean playing in front of crowds of that size in an iconic rugby location definitely has got to be part of the experience for development. No question of a doubt, you know, and playing the quality of players that we're going to play. You know, I know the British and Irish Lions are on tour, but. Uh, it, it, it'll still be two very, very good rugby teams in Ireland and in England. Um, you know, uh, we often, often, you know, it, it's the case that, you know, those second stringer guys, well, they're not really second stringers because it's not actually an England B team. It's just the guys who are not going to be there from Ireland. You know, often they're going to see this as an opportunity to take their chance, you know, and if uh, Carl Sinclair is away, you know, then it may be a, a wonderful opportunity for the next tight head to really put his hand up and, and put up a good showing, you know, and um, and and so in many ways, it's it's uh, it's almost actually going to be tougher from that point of view because uh, if I can explain it like this, it's going to be like for like. So a young Max Malins who hasn't played a lot of Test rugby, he's going to see this as an opportunity to impress Eddie Jones. Whereas if Elliot Daly was available and Max Malins didn't get selected, you know, it could be a situation where Elliot Daly comes in and probably, you know. Who knows? I'm not saying saying they would underestimate us, but, you know, they may think it'll be an easier test match. Whereas, you know, that's not going to be the case of, of, in their case, a a young debutant or even a a young pup who hasn't played a lot of test match rugby is going to take this incredibly seriously. So in in, in many ways, I think the test matches are almost actually going to be, be tougher for us, you know, from that point of view. And that's great. That's wonderful. I mean, that's what we need to do. We need to do a lot more of that before we get to the next World Cup. We need to play in these iconic stadiums and understand what the pressure looks like and, you know, start to to enjoy that pressure and, and, and thrive off it. And as you say, you know, get the crowd behind us as well. I think the one thing that's going to be really wonderful is, is no, no, no matter where we play around the world, there's always going to be a fantastic fan base from an American point of view, you know. So, um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited that if, if it's 10,000 or it's 30,000, you know, that we'll get a lot of local supporters from, from uh, USA Eagles supporters based out in London. 
No, no doubt about that. There's a good American contingent uh, in and around London that definitely come to the game. And it's also kind of ironic or not ironic, but iconic that uh, although it's lost on many people, that the game will be on the 4th of July, our Independence Day against England. So that should be interesting. Well, well, uh, Gary, I think you've got a flight to catch. So I'm going to ask you uh, one final question here and and thank you for your time. But the last question I want to ask is that looking at your selection for this and and all the players, everybody appears to be playing at professional rugby level, whether it's uh, out playing for the Western force like Marcel Branch is doing, um, or if it's, it's guys playing for the, the South Sharks or playing here in Major League Rugby. Uh, are the days of a couple World Cup cycles ago gone forever now? Because American uh, Eagles rugby was always, well, how do we find these players? A couple guys like Chris Wiles is playing overseas, Ty Clever is playing overseas. But beyond that, I mean, you really had to go hunt down rugby clubs and, and find guys that were transitioning from football probably to rugby and learning the game. Uh, are chances for folks coming up that way, are they gone? Or is it was your selection this year focused in this respect because you had the COVID pandemic to deal with and you couldn't just do everything? So I guess my question is, Will we see um, amateurs uh, on the teams in the future, or is it going to be a focus on professionals? Do you think going forward, at least during your tenure? No, I would. I would never say that the the days of picking a guy out of a club are gone. I would never say that. Um, I, I would, though, in all honesty, say that it would probably be highly unlikely because because I'm looking at you know a depth chart of sixty to eighty players. I'd love a depth chart of one hundred and twenty. And I think we'll get there sooner rather than later. But at the moment now, we're sitting with a comfortable depth chart of 60, where we four four deep per position and, and, and reasonably comfortable. I mean, that's four quality players in each one of those positions that we're looking at in the depth chart. And that we've narrowed down to 41. And then, you know, you, you know obviously now we've narrowed that down to 30. Um, and that's with injuries and guys who can't tour, et cetera, et cetera. But, but if that's what I'm doing, can you imagine what the 13 MLR clubs are doing? If you think I'm looking for the best amateur at, out in Dallas or Mystic or where, where, um, Belmont Shore or Glendale, wherever I'm going to look across the country, what do you think the MLR clubs are doing? Because they want to recruit locally as well. Most of them do. Um, they would want an opportunity to be able to bring in um, the next best American talent that there is. There's crossover camps that are going going on a- around the country, but some very, very successful ones. Currently, I mean, tomorrow, the place we I'm going to tomorrow is, we're we going to Utah because there's a Talent ID Day there, which Hugh Bevan and, and the crew have been running for seven weeks now in seven different locations from Hawaii to Seattle to Salt Lake to all over the show. And that's also trying to unearth the next talents in our U20s and our U23 ranks, U18s and U20s, I beg your pardon. And so all these clubs are looking for these players and geographically, they're going to have a much better idea whether you're in Boston, who your local clubs are, whether you're in New York, who your local clubs are, you know, and and there's a potential that one or two more major league clubs will come on board next year. So that's going to make it up to 14 or 16. So, with all of those guys recruiting and bringing guys in, whether that's on an AC contract, which is just a just a, just a, a, a daily rate contract, or whether they're going to get a full professional contract, they're going to be exposed to that form of rugby. So it, it's a wonderful scenario for rugby players around the country that, you know, if they're half decent, there's probably a club that's going to look at them and pick them up. You know, I mean, if, if they're in that position to, to play. But, I mean, you very well may have a situation where a guy is a qualified lawyer already or he's a, he's a doctor or he's a professional. And he, you know, he's got his own plumbing business and he doesn't necessarily want to play professional rugby, but he'll go down and he'll make himself available for the local club team. And, and I'm quite sure we'll hear about those guys. You know, I'm quite sure that we would never close the door on those guys. So I, 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 I would never say no to something like that, it's just going to be less and less likely to happen because thankfully, I might add, thankfully we've got a wonderful striving um, domestic game in the MLR at the moment and those guys are are working incredibly hard to recruit great rugby players. Locally is better as well because it's it's more cost effective and because you've got no limitations in the amount of American players, US-based players you can have and so it makes sense all around. So um, thankfully, in many ways, the MLR clubs are, are really helping me with my job in a, in, a, in a very, very, in a very, very big way. But no, I would never say I would never close the door, but I would say it's, it's going to be less and less likely. 
Well, Gary, thanks a lot. That's uh, really encouraging news. I mean, I, I, I figured you weren't closing the door, but I want to make it clear to people uh, mm-hmm. by getting your feedback that because we've got professional rugby here in the States now, and, and you've, you've really fleshed this out by saying that, you know, all these clubs are looking for this talent. You've actually got, you know, a dozen talent scouts helping you out uh, indirectly with Major League Rugby looking for all these players and bringing them people's attention. So it really does help out. And that's some good news. But I mean, you know, it's, it's not like 1991. Hey, um, who plays rugby? I heard this guy in Colorado plays. Let's get him to come out and try out for the team it'll be more challenging you've got to have a more traditional path no 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 it's not going to be like that anymore but also don't underestimate the value of the college game as well you know i mean the college game unfortunately they've been really badly hit unfortunately you know they have played very very little rugby or very few of them have been able to play rugby you know when when the college game gets back up and running and those kids are at university you know, and now we, we're getting our, our D1A league up and running and, and, and you, you know, you're able to watch the Lindenwoods and St. Mary's and Kells of the world and uh, Arkansas and Arkansas State and or BYU all over the show. You know, then that's another pool that I would absolutely definitely not ignore because that's where your next crop of, of brilliant talent is, you know, and, you know, there, I, I, I absolutely have no question of a doubt that there, there would definitely be some kids, young guys, not kids, I'll be your pardon, young, younger guys at university, you know, seniors who, who would be knocking on the door. And, and if they're good enough, they're old enough. You know, that's pretty much my philosophy. So, you know, who also may be, you know, looking at, at, at the next opportunity to play for the Eagles. Now, you mentioned that, of course, the Cal Bears and you've got Arizona, you've got Kutztown, you've got life, lots of great rugby programs out there at the collegiate level. And, and yeah, they've, they've been eviscerated that the the the, uh, the sevens version, the collegiate rugby championship CRC, which is normally in Philadelphia, wasn't there this year. It was postponed last year. They did it in New Orleans. Very different sort of thing. But Gary, I know you've got to catch a flight, so I want to thank you. And uh, if I somehow figure out the secret code and de- get the decoder ring for the body cavity search and DNA to make it to the uh, Twickenham game, maybe we can link up and. Uh, and, and do an interview there. And, and, and I've, of course, if I'm going to get Twickenham, I'm going to have to follow my way over to get the river lifting and have a few Guinnesses to make it to Aviva. So, uh, but if I don't make it best of luck to the Eagles and we're really looking forward to, to seeing you guys um, excel on, on the pitch. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, Gary. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me again. And yeah, hopefully many of you can travel and it'll be awesome to see you all over across the pond in, 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 uh, in the next month. Thanks all for right. your time, Chris. Oh, and thank you for yours, Gary. We'll, we'll catch up with you again. Thanks a lot, and um, a safe journey. Thank you very much. All the best. All right, cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, that's USA Eagles head coach Gary Gold, who joined me for this session. Really appreciate him taking the time to pop in here and get us up to date on his selections for the uh, summer test series. Uh, if you're not aware, if the USA Eagles will be traveling to Twickenham in London to play the England side, and that's a, a game on the 4th of July. U.S. Independence Day, no less. Uh, the, the time for that game has not been announced. At the moment, uh, the initial setup was that only 10,000 spectators would be there. They're already selling tickets for that game. But as Gary said, it looks like they're going to probably up that with the lockdown restrictions easing the U.K., possibly to as many as 30,000. That should be epic for Eagles who've never been to Twickenham and for fans who want to go watch the game. And then they'll follow that up six days later with a game in Dublin at Aviva Stadium against Ireland, and that should be epic as well. So that's two. And then later in the summer, uh, the Eagles will take on Canada as part of the qualification for the 2023 Rugby World Cup that takes place in France.